The story you are about to hear is the startling and dramatic record of a people, a mighty people whose hand has helped to shape our history and whose destiny shall be mingled with our own. Their account properly begins in the city of Jerusalem in the year when King Zedekiah began his reign. In this year, about 600 B.C., a righteous man named Lehi became concerned about the many prophets of God who were warning of impending destruction and captivity of Jerusalem unless the people repented of their sins and returned to God. Lehi, while engaged in prayer concerning this matter, had a vision in which he was given a book to read. This book foretold the great destruction which was to befall his people. So forceful was the message shown Lehi that he too went about the city in an attempt to warn the people about the judgments of God. Wherever he went, however, he was scorned and ridiculed by his fellow citizens of Jerusalem. It came to the point where the people even tried to take his life but the power of God delivered him from their hands. Once again the Lord revealed himself to Lehi. This time he was told to take his family and flee from the city. Being full of faith, Lehi persuaded his family to follow him. And leaving all behind them except their provisions, the family departed Jerusalem and traveled southward into the wilderness beside the Red Sea. Here, in a small river valley, the family camped. With Lehi was his wife, Sariah, and his four sons, Laman, Lemuel, Nephi, and Sam. Nephi and Sam, the younger brothers, had great faith in God and in the leadership of their father. They were anxious to please the Lord in every possible way and to them was given the knowledge that they would be directed to a land of promise and abundance. The elder brothers, however, were resentful because they had to leave the luxury of their home, and the very onset of this momentous journey finds them rebellious toward their younger brothers. While the family was encamped in the desert fastness, they were instructed by the Lord to return again to Jerusalem that they might obtain the history of their people. The four brothers set forth to get these records which were held by a man named Laban. Much to their dismay, their every effort ended in failure, and they were even driven back into the desert by the servants of Laban. That evening, under the cover of darkness, Nephi returned alone to the home of Laban. Upon approaching the house, Nephi stumbled over the body of the man as he lay in a drunken stupor. Taking the man's clothing and sword, Nephi disguised himself and ordered a servant to bring the records before him. The servant brought the records, and only then, discovering the identity of Nephi, he tried to flee. Nephi caught him, however, and held him fast that he might not spread the alarm. As soon as the servant, whose name was Zoram, was calmed, Nephi persuaded him also to accompany the family in their flight from the city of Jerusalem. Once again, the brothers returned to Jerusalem. This time they visited the home of a righteous man named Ishmael. With much persuasion, Ishmael and his family finally consented to return with them to the wilderness and join with them in their journey. When the group returned to the desert valley, Lehi and his family were overjoyed to see them. An altar was constructed there in the wilderness, and the little band offered up their thanksgiving to God. Soon came the time to make adequate preparation for the great journey which lay before them. The people gathered all their belongings and then set about the task of gathering stores of seed to be used in their new homeland. Perhaps foremost among their possessions were the records which they had obtained. These records contained the writings of Moses, the history of the Jewish people, 
the writings of God's prophets, and the genealogy of Lehi, who was a descendant of Joseph, who was sold into bondage. During this period of preparation for their impending journey, the sons of Lehi were married to the daughters of Ishmael. Little could they have known that this union of two humble families in the privation of an Asian desert would bring forth a people who were to conquer a new world. One night soon after this, Lehi was commanded to continue the journey. Because of his great faith, Nephi had begun to take on a leadership role. The Lord had instructed him to forge thin metal plates for writing upon and on which to keep a full account of he and his people. These plates were to be handed down from one generation to another as the Lord gave wisdom, and all the history and ministry of the people recorded. Nephi records that on the first morning of the journey, Lehi found a round brass ball on which were two spindles, one of which worked by faith to point the way they should travel into the wilderness. Through a land mostly devoid of vegetation, the curious ball led them through the most fertile parts of the wilderness, which were in the borders near the Red Sea. In spite of this, their trials were great. There were frequent disputations and confrontations involving Nephi's older brothers, Laman and Lemuel, and some of Ishmael's family against Nephi and Lehi, though with each rebellion the Lord would intervene to soften the hearts of the aggressors. Bearing affliction, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, they journeyed south and east for the space of several years, during which time Ishmael died. Their hope was greatly renewed one day as they reached the peak of a small mount. There before them was a great sea, and next to that in the valley below them was a lush green land. They found the area to be rich in grains, nuts, and fruits, so much so that Lehi named the land Bountiful. Nephi was instructed by the Lord to build a ship and even provided guidance for its construction, which was unlike any they had ever before seen. Nephi made tools of ore, which he did molten out of the rock, and after many weeks of hard work and hours of fervent prayer, the ship was made ready. Summing up great faith, the families gathered their possessions into the vessel and put out to sea. Soon they were being driven before the wind toward the strange new land that was to be their home. It was with mixed emotions that the little band watched their homeland fall away behind them. Those of their number who believed in the words of the Lord felt that they were being directed to a choice land a land of peace and beauty, a land that had been promised their forefathers long before as the land of their inheritance. Some of the group, however, still harbored resentment deep within themselves that they had been forced to give up their homes and lives of ease, and after many days at sea, this resentment began to grow until dissension broke out within the family. The brothers of Nephi began to quarrel and speak with rudeness to their younger brother and their father. Soon they forgot the commandments of God altogether and began to spend all their time in revelry. When Nephi rebuked them for their forgetfulness, his brothers bound him hand and foot. While he was thus secured, a terrible storm arose at sea.
wind tore at the vessel and howled through the rigging. Mountainous waves towered over the little craft in its frightened passage. The vessel was driven before the storm for three fear-ridden days. So great were the waves that everyone feared they were to be swallowed up by the sea. Because of their great fear, they once again turned to God and pleaded for his protection. In this attitude of fear and humility, they realized how great had been their lack of faith, and they released their brother Nephi. Soon the storm subsided, and they were once again able to sail their ship toward the promised land. For many days we sailed peacefully before the gentle winds. Even when the winds did not blow, it seemed that our vessel was being carried steadily forward on a slow but constant current of water in the sea. Of such a current I had never heard. Nephi! Nephi! Landing Rushing to the bow of the vessel, the most beautiful sight met our eyes. There along the horizon rose the green peaks of mountains above the monotonous swells of that endless sea. Oh, how we rejoiced that day. Late in the afternoon, we reached the shelter of a little harbor. With eagerness, we drove our little craft through the surf and, and upon the shore of this promised land. With joy, we gave thanks to the Lord. And then we pitched our tents upon the shores of our new home. We were anxious to explore the land roundabout, and reluctantly, we set about the tasks that had to be done making safe and secure our stores and camp for the night. In the morning, I arose eagerly as the sun was just rising. When I looked out across that immense ocean, I knew it was only the hand of God which could have brought our fragile little vessel over so great an expanse. Surely he had led us to the land of promise. Now in his last days upon this earth, Lehi called his children together to give them his blessing. Once again they were reminded that they could live in peace and prosperity in the land only as long as they remembered to serve the Lord. He prophesied that none should come to this land except those directed by the Lord, and that it would be a land of liberty as long as they remained righteous. Finally, Lehi earnestly admonished his sons to accept the leadership of their brother Nephi whose faith and wisdom had been great throughout their journey. Not long after giving this final admonition and blessing to his sons, Lehi died. It was only a few days after the death of Lehi until the older brothers began to protest against the leadership of Nephi. Their anger increased to the extent that they planned to kill him. But Nephi was warned in a dream to take those who wished to go with him and move to another part of the country. Only those believing in the warning and the revelations of God accompanied Nephi. The number included Zoram, Sam, Jacob, Joseph, the sisters of Nephi and their families. The followers of Nephi requested him soon to become their king, and he consented to accept this responsibility, although he warned them that it would be better if they did not have a king. Under his leadership, the people of Nephi soon became prosperous in their new home. Their crops were good, and they produced flocks of animals of all kinds. They learned to build and to use skillfully all of the great variety of materials that the land provided in abundance. They soon became skilled artisans of wood, copper, brass, iron, gold, and silver. These people followed the law of Moses, and the brothers of Nephi were consecrated as priests to serve the increasing numbers of the Nephite people. In contrast to the industrious habits of these people, 
the followers of Laman became ever more indolent and shiftless, preferring to live on the wild game in the forest rather than raise crops. These people became ever more wicked and more treacherous. They soon began to live by waging warfare upon the more productive and industrious Nephites. Another change came upon these people as well. As their savagery increased and they lost the noble characteristics of their culture, they began to change in appearance, ever becoming more coarse, until they were a people savage in appearance and dark of countenance. From time to time the Nephites attempted to restore their brothers to a faith in God, but their efforts were in vain. Soon the Nephites were forced to fortify their cities and defend themselves against the warlike Lamanites. For a period of several hundred years the affairs of these people continued in this manner. Periods of prosperity and peace were interspersed with violent wars in which many people lost their lives. And thus the promise of the Lord was fulfilled in the lives of these people. Whenever the Nephites became engrossed in their riches and pride, they were engulfed in warfare with their former brothers, the Lamanites. From time to time the Nephites were forced to abandon their cities and flee into the wilderness. It was upon one of these occasions that the Nephites discovered there had been another civilization upon this land that was unknown to them. They found the remains of great cities that had been laid waste and signs of great battles and destruction. And now, during one of their flights from the Lamanites, they discovered a man of gigantic stature who was the sole survivor of a race of mighty people whose population had numbered in the millions. The story told by this man whose name was Coriantumr of the rise and fall of a great civilization is one of man's greatest epics. Well the Nephites might have pondered over his account of their predecessors in this land, for the course of the Nephites' history seemed to be following the pattern which brought about the destruction of the people of Coriantumr. Coriantumr related that 2,000 years ago, at the time of the confusion of languages at the Tower of Babel, a man named Jared and his brother pleaded to God that their tongues be not confused. Their plea was heard, and the Lord instructed the brothers and some companions to head northward from the plains of Shinar. After a long journey they came to a land of many waters, from which they turned westward for many, many more days until they finally arrived at the coast of a great sea. There they remained for four years before the Lord revealed to the brother of Jared how to build vessels in which to cross the sea. They built eight vessels, pointed at each end, and completely sealed, whereupon they cried unto the Lord for light within the vessels. Again, because of the great faith of the brother of Jared, the Lord responded. The brother of Jared smelted sixteen stones, and God touched them with his finger, causing them to give forth light. Placing themselves entirely in the hands of the Lord, they put forth, and the Lord caused a great wind to carry the vessels speedily across the many miles until they reached their destination nearly a year later. When they set their feet upon the shores of this new land, they knelt at once to praise and thank the Lord. They in turn were told to walk humbly before God and obey His commandments. They tilled the new land and prospered and multiplied. Many years passed and many kings reigned, some good, some bad. The people spread over the face of the whole land and they became highly skilled in all manner of workmanship and crafts. Their wealth increased also, but so did their pride and wickedness, whereupon they were admonished to repent, or their bones would become as heaps upon the land. They chose to ignore this counsel. 
Finally, Coriantumr inherited the throne and tried to be a good and a just ruler. Everywhere there were power-hungry men, both within and without the kingdom. An old prophet told Coriantumr to change his ways or all the people would be destroyed. But Coriantumr couldn't put aside his hatred for their enemy, and there was also too much turmoil within the kingdom for the king to waste time with some vain philosophy. Once again, the prophets were ignored. Soon, a great opposing army had appeared. There was much murder and plunder within the kingdom, but after some time, Coriantumr was able to put together a sizable army with which to make battle. Then commenced a great, great battle, lasting many days, resulting in many thousands of deaths. In a moment of reflection, while the handful of remaining warriors were asleep in a drunken-like state of hatred and anger, Coriantumr remembered the words of the old prophet. But it was too late. As the sun arose on that last day of battle, the fervor was no less than the very first day. Their hatred toward one another drove them on relentlessly until all were dead save Coriantumr. Once again, the prophetic words stung at his mind, All your people to be destroyed if you do not turn from your pride and hatred. Coriantumr lived among his newfound friends for several months before he died. With his death, the 2,000-year history of a nation was brought to a close, a nation whose own willfulness and pride made them choose death rather than life. The time was now about 130 B.C., and many important events had transpired among the Nephite people. They had been forced to flee from place to place in the land. In their journeys, they discovered not only the ruins of Coriantumr's people, but they came across another large group of their former countrymen who had escaped the destruction of Jerusalem during the reign of King Zedekiah. Though the language and customs of these people had become corrupted in the intervening years, the two groups were delighted at the discovery and joined together into one nation of people in a land they called Zarahemla. The leader of these united people was a wise and good ruler named Mosiah. While the people of Zarahemla prospered under the righteous rule of Mosiah, elsewhere in the land were other people not so fortunate. One large segment of the Nephite people were isolated in the jungle wilderness from their brethren. These people were surrounded and harassed by the warlike Lamanites. They were enabled to retain their lands and their freedom until they came under the rule of a wicked and perverse leader named King Noah. This man taxed the people heavily that he and his court might live in luxury, and under his rule the people became ever more corrupt and wicked. Finally there arose in the land a prophet of the Lord named Abinadi. He went among the people exhorting them to repent and return to obedience to the law of Moses. He warned the people that unless they did so they would be destroyed completely and that only their records would remain as a testimony to the people who would someday possess the land. Abinadi was soon imprisoned and brought before King Noah and his priests. When questioned by the king, Abinadi spoke with great power and authority. He proclaimed to them God's plan of salvation for mankind. He taught again the law of Moses, and he explained the writings of the prophets, calling upon King Noah to believe and repent. So angry was the king that he caused Abinadi to be put to death. But the powerful words of this righteous man had a lasting influence in the life of one young man of the king's court. This young man was Alma, and he now went about the land teaching the marvelous things he had come to understand. Alma soon gathered together a large group of followers who desired to follow after the ways of God. 
These people were so persecuted that they left everything behind them and fled into the comparative safety of the wilderness. There, in the beauty of forest and mountain fastness, they learn to walk uprightly before the Lord. They sealed their vows to serve God by being baptized in a fountain of pure water. They would never forget the beauty of this wilderness where they first experienced the presence of the Almighty in their lives. After many days of journeying in the wilderness, these people at last arrived in the land of Zarahemla where they were received with joy by Mosiah and his people. Under the leadership of these two men, Mosiah and Alma, the Nephite people were blessed and they prospered in the land. After several years had passed, many people in the land began to oppose the church and persecute its members. Among these were the sons of Mosiah and one of the sons of Alma, also called Alma. A remarkable experience changed the course of their lives. An angel appeared before them and told them that the church of the Lord was established and nothing could destroy it but transgression. When the angel finished his admonition, Alma found himself unable to speak and was carried helpless to his father who called for the people to fast and pray for his son's recovery and conversion. After two days, young Alma, regaining his strength, stood and proclaimed his intention to serve God in every possible way. From that time on, Alma and his companions used their energies to promote the work of the Lord. Mosiah, now growing old, requested that the people choose their new king. His son Aaron, whom the people chose, declined the throne, as did his three brothers. For these young men desired to go out into the wilderness and preach to the Lamanites and endeavor to promote peace between the two peoples. King Mosiah suggested that judges be appointed by the voice of the people to administer the affairs of government according to the commandments of God. The people loved and respected King Mosiah, and so they followed his advice, happy in the hope of full self-government and liberty. And so, 509 years after Lehi left Jerusalem, the Nephites began the reign of the judges, with Alma as their first chief judge. The sons of Mosiah labored among the Lamanites for many years, and through their efforts thousands of these people were converted to a belief in God and looked forward to the coming of Christ. These people laid down their weapons of war and came to live in peace among their Nephite brethren. Most of the Lamanite people, however, remained rebellious and unbelieving. In the succeeding years, several leaders rose among the Nephite people. Two of these young men were named after their esteemed ancestors, Nephi and Lehi. These two brothers fell into the hands of savage Lamanites and were cast into prison. When an attempt was made to kill them, the power of God was miraculously manifest and its results were far-reaching. A great fire broke out in the prison, encircling the two young men, but they were unhurt by the flames. The Lamanites could only stand in dumb amazement at this display, but the brothers told them not to fear, for it was God who had shown them his miraculous power. But then the walls of the prison began to shake, and they seemed to be covered by a cloud of darkness, yet the prison did not fall. A solemn fear came upon the other prisoners and their captors. Suddenly a voice was heard from above the cloud. It was a soft voice of perfect mildness as if it had been a whisper, yet it did pierce even to the very soul, saying, Repent ye, repent ye, and seek no more to destroy my servants whom I have sent unto you to declare good tidings. In the cloud of darkness the Lamanites stood transfixed in their awful fear. The Spirit of God fell upon Nephi and Lehi and they were able to speak marvelous words. The Lamanites were so impressed by such a display of divine power 
that their lives were marvelously changed that day. They laid down forever their weapons of war and returned to the Nephites all the land that had been taken from them in previous years. They became more righteous than the Nephite people and more steadfast in their faith. Because of their determination to serve God, they were now preaching repentance to the Nephites who had drifted away from complete faith and trust in the promises of the Lord. With this dramatic change, the Lord looked down upon the world in its voyage through time and space, setting the stage for some of the most remarkable events recorded in the pages of history. Mother, Mother, tell Marion about when you were a little girl, when all the city Oh, is that what you were telling us about? Tell us again. All right, children. She is just our age. Be still then, and I'll tell you once again of the time when I was a young girl. Certainly I have lived in a most remarkable time. I guess no one has ever seen such changes in one lifetime as I have. When I was a girl, the age of you children, things were much different than they are today. The whole land was in turmoil, and people weren't safe anywhere. My parents couldn't let us children play outside the walls of the city, for the forests were filled with evil and dangerous men. Some of these people were Lamanites, but many were Nephites, and they had joined together in great bands which robbed and killed everyone they could find outside the protective walls of the cities. Many women and children were caught as they went out to work in the fields and were carried off by the robbers, and they were never heard of again. It was a time of fear and great sadness for our people. These days of my childhood weren't happy times for me. My parents seemed upset and troubled most of the time. They constantly talked of the wickedness of our own friends and neighbors. This seemed to bother them more than the robbers outside the walls. It bothered me, too, because I couldn't see anything so wicked about my friends or their parents. It's true that most of them no longer worshipped with us in the temple, and they didn't like it when my father talked to them about God. But this was true of almost everyone. Why, even the judges of the land didn't worship in the temple with us. And then something happened that changed my whole viewpoint. It shocked and frightened me more than anything ever had before. I was walking through the crowded marketplace with a friend when we heard a great commotion near one of the gates of the city. Being curious, we hurried to see what caused the excitement. As we drew near, we saw a large crowd of people gathered in the street. Many of them were murmuring or shouting, and their attention seemed to be focused on something in the center of the crowd. Then as we watched, they all began to move toward the gate. When they neared the gate, the people parted, and we could see several men dragging a Lamanite to the gate. I supposed it was some thief they had caught in the marketplace, for they threw him outside the walls, and demanded that he never return. As we were making our way homeward through the crowd, we were startled to hear a familiar voice cry out, Woe to the city of Zarahemla! It sounded as if it had come from above us. And looking upward, we saw the same Lamanite who had been cast out, standing atop the wall of the city. This time we were so close that I could recognize him. Why, it was Samuel, a new but dear friend of my parents. For several weeks he had been preaching about the city, and all of us liked him immensely, for he was an inspired man of God. But how could this be the man who had been thrown out of our city? Bewildered, I turned my attention to what he was saying. Behold, I give unto you a sign, for five years more cometh, and then cometh the Son of God to redeem all those who shall believe on his name. This will I give unto you for a sign at the time of his coming. There shall be great lights in the heaven, insomuch that the night before he cometh there shall be no darkness. And behold, there shall be a new star arise, such a one as ye have never beheld. And in the day that he shall suffer death, 
the sun shall be darkened and refuse to give light unto you, and also the moon and the stars. There shall be great tempests, and the earth shall shake and tremble. Woe unto this people, unless they shall repent when they see all these signs and wonders which shall be shown unto them. My mind was pulled away from the marvelous things he was saying by the sound of angry voices all around me. I looked at the people by my side, and to my amazement their faces were choked with anger and hatred, and everywhere were men trying to kill our friend. In terror I fled from that awful scene. Running home I fled sobbing into the arms of my mother, thinking they too would be filled with dread at my story. I was amazed to see their faces light up with joy. At last, said my father, at last we shall see the Son of God. But all was not to be joyful. Samuel's prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah became a source of contention among the people. The righteous believers looked eagerly for the signs which were to herald Christ's coming. But as the time drew near, many who had believed began to doubt. The unbelief of the scoffers increased until finally in anger they set a day on which all who believed in the coming of the Son of God would be put to death unless Samuel's predictions were fulfilled in every detail. Of course, this caused great fear and concern among the faithful. The appointed evening found my family kneeling in prayer to God for the safety of all our friends. As we knelt, a deep feeling of comfort came over us and we rose expectantly to await whatever the night might bring. And what a night it was. That very night, Samuel's prophecy was fulfilled. And we know that beyond the sea, the Messiah was born. For when the sun went down, there was no darkness. A new star made the heavens as bright as day, and many who had not believed fell to the earth in amazement for they knew this was the fulfillment of the prophecy. After witnessing these marvelous things, the greater part of the people in the land were converted to the Lord. Many were baptized and joined with us in worship on the Sabbath. At last there was peace in the land. But it seems that the memory of people is short-lived, for within but a few years contentions became numerous. The church was divided, and the government became corrupt. Finally, the government fell, and the people lived in clans and tribes, each with its own set of laws. Things became worse and worse, until one day, in the 34th year after the birth of Christ, a terrible storm swept across the land. Thunder, lightning, and violent whirlwinds filled the sky. The whole face of the land was changed by violent earthquakes. Entire cities were buried, and some sank into the depths of the sea. The number of dead was too great to reckon. These great disasters took place within the space of about three hours. Three hours that none of the living would ever forget. These calamities were followed by three days of thick darkness so intense that it could be felt by those of us who survived. One day, soon after, a great number of people were gathered around the temple in the land bountiful, wondering and marveling at the signs that had told of the death of Christ. Suddenly we heard a voice, but we couldn't understand it. It was not a loud voice, nor harsh, but it caused me to tremble, and my heart burned within me. A second time we heard the voice, but still we could not understand it. When the voice spoke the third time, we understood the words. Behold my, my beloved, beloved Son, Son, in whom I am well pleased, in whom I have glorified my name. Hear ye him. Looking upward, Toward the sound, we saw a man descending out of heaven. He came and stood among us. At first we thought it was an angel, but he stretched forth his hand and said, I am Jesus Christ, of whom the prophets testified. 
With joy we fell to the earth and worshipped him, who was so long awaited. Jesus called Nephi to come forth from the multitude. He taught him how to baptize and gave him power and authority to baptize the people. He called others, twelve in all, and gave them the same authority. As Jesus continued to speak, the multitudes gathered around him. He instructed them even as he had the people in Jerusalem. He taught them to love one another and to pray. He requested the people to bring their little children to him, that he might bless them. When he had done this, the heavens were opened, and we saw angels descending in the midst of fire, and they came down and ministered to the little ones. He then told his disciples to bring bread and wine, and when they had done so, he blessed it and told them to always do this in remembrance of him. He then commanded the disciples to give the bread and wine to each of us who believed and were baptized in his name. Oh, what joy was ours that day. For many days the Lord appeared among our people. He healed the sick, the blind, and the lame who came to him. And yet as we gathered with him, we heard and saw marvelous, unspeakable things. Great power and blessings came into the lives of all who believed and were baptized in the name of Jesus. From that time on, we were called the Church of Christ. All these things happened when you were little children, so you know the rest of the story. You have seen the miracles that the disciples of Jesus have wrought, and you know how the Lord has blessed and prospered his people. Why, for once, righteousness, peace, and equality are to be found in all the land. I suppose that in all the world there could not be a happier people created by the hand of God. For 200 years, the people upon this continent enjoyed a golden era, basking in the blessings of God. But the ever-growing prosperity brought once again to the land the curse of pride. Soon class distinctions became common, and the followers of Christ grew fewer and fewer as the years passed. With the passing of time, great changes took place throughout the land. Once again, there was a separation of the Nephite and Lamanite peoples. As their hatred and selfishness grew, fierce warfare again racked the continent. In the fighting that ensued, the Nephite people were driven and hounded across the face of the land. City after city fell in spite of the courageous and inspired leadership of a man named Mormon. As the clouds of warfare covered the land, Mormon was saddened to see that even in their affliction, the Nephite people refused to turn to the Lord. Finally, the people grew so wicked and fierce that Mormon refused any longer to lead them. Into his hand had been entrusted the records of his people, and now Mormon proceeded to bring them up to date. Near the end of his life, Mormon gave these records to his son Moroni whose responsibility was to abridge the long history of his people. This man witnessed about 400 A.D. the final destruction of the Nephite people. His father had been killed in a final great battle, and to his knowledge the Nephites had all been destroyed by their ancient enemy. He alone remained of the mighty Nephite nation. In his sorrow and loneliness, Moroni abridged the records of his people. He sealed them up and buried them on a hillside in a land far to the north where he had fled from the Lamanites. But his record was closed with a note of triumph, for Moroni realized that this record would someday come forth and be of great worth to the descendants of the Lamanites, now known as the American Indian, to the house of Israel, and to the Gentiles who would be led one day to this land by the hand of God, as were his own forefathers. (laughs) 
listener, for 3,000 years the Lord had caused the words and history of his people to be recorded, and for another thousand to lie protected in the bosom of the earth. All this to one purpose, that you might hear the words of those who whisper out of the dust. For they whisper of God's love for all mankind. They speak again of his patience and long-suffering. They are an added testimony that he works with and through faithful people in every generation and in every place. They remind us as well of the willfulness of man and the consequences of his disobedience. They tell also of the great joy and happiness which belong to the children of God. Above all, the words from this ancient record, the Book of Mormon, can speak to you of marvelous events that shall transpire in these latter days, words upon which your salvation may well depend. Will you hear these words which whisper through the power of Almighty God out of the dust of time?